What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Smoke and Tire Podcast. This week's episode is brought to you by Valvoline, America's very first motor oil brand. And for 150 years, they've been innovating, creating, and reinventing motor oil. From the very first high mileage to the first synthetic blend to the first racing oil, they have never stopped pursuing innovation to maximize engine life. And their latest innovation, Extended Protection Full Synthetic Motor Oil, provides 50% better wear protection than industry standards and is 10 times stronger against oil breakdown. Valvoline Extended Protection is specifically formulated with dual defense additive technology combining an innovative additive boosted with a fortified detergent system. Why do you need it? You might not think that you're a severe driver, but short trips, towing, extreme temperatures, turbocharged engines, heavy loads, and spirited drives put extra pressure on your engine. And people like Chris Forsberg, Rob Dom, Freddie Hernandez, Speed Academy, Gears and Gasoline, Dustin Williams, TJ Hunt, and more all trust Valvoline in their cars. They are the only motor oil with a dedicated engine lab where they can run specialized engine tests and standardized engine tests right in their own facility. And Valvoline is the world's number one supplier of EV battery fluids, offering tailored products to help extend vehicle range and efficiency. Find Valvoline now at your local auto parts store. Ask for it by name. We're also brought to you today by Mint Mobile. How could saving money and spending less money not be one of your top goals for 2022. Why still pay insane amounts of money every month for wireless? Switching to Mint Mobile is the easiest way to save this year. As the first company to sell premium wireless service online only, Mint Mobile lets you maximize your savings with plans starting at just 15 bucks a month. I assure you, my old school grandfathered in plan is more than 15 bucks a month. If I switched right now, I'd probably be saving a lot of money and I'd have more money to blow on my cars. Dumb things on my cars by not blowing it, by giving it away to legacy uh, cellular companies, right? So people looking for extra savings this year, Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for just 15 bucks a month by going online only and eliminating the traditional costs of retail. Mint Mobile passes significant savings on to you. All their plans come with unlimited talk and text plus high speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. You can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan, keep your same phone number, keep all your existing contacts, keep all that stuff. All that switch is the amount that appears on your monthly statement. It's going to be way less with Mint Mobile. You can choose the amount of monthly data that's right for you and stop paying for data that you never use. So switch to Mint Mobile and get premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, Go to mintmobile.com slash tire. That's mintmobile.com slash tire. Cut your wireless bill to just 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash tire. And of course, we are still brought to you by the Blackview DR750X 3 Channel Plus Dash Cam. It's a mouthful, but I'm going to explain to you what it all means, right? Having one camera protecting your car is good. Having two cameras protecting your car is great. What about having three of them? Even better, right? Blackview's first triple channel dash cam is here, and it lets you keep an eye on the front, the rear, and the interior of your vehicle at all times for complete peace of mind. Right, The Blackview DR750X 3 Channel Plus simultaneously records the front, rear, and interior of your vehicle. Each of these cameras is equipped with a Sony CMOS Starvis sensor in the front and rear, and the interior camera connects to the main and front camera via a micro USB. The triple channel model includes a GPS logger, 
Built-in Wi-Fi, cloud connectivity, and built-in voltage monitoring for parking mode so you can use it as a security camera when you're parked without having to worry about draining your battery and not being able to start the thing, right? The dash cam comes with a free Blackview app, which allows you to connect to your dash cam directly over the cloud, get impact notifications, download videos to your mobile device, watch live view and more, right? Moreover, Blackview's seamless pairing feature makes connecting to your dash cam incredibly easy. When hardwired, the Blackview DR750X 3-channel automatically switches to parking mode to monitor your parked vehicle. Thanks to the video buffer, the few seconds leading to triggering events are also recorded. They sent me one, and I love this Blackview cam. It gives me the peace of mind that I can always check up on my vehicle no matter where I am. If you heard recently about uh, Zach's uh, girlfriend's stuff being stolen out of her locked, parked Honda Fit, if she had a Blackview camera running, uh, the police might be identif able to identify the assailants. More importantly, we would have an amazing video to share with you guys of people uh, stealthily breaking into her car and ste stealing her stuff, and we could make that money back on the video. So go to Blackview, B-L-A-C-K-V-U-E dot com slash T-S-T and use the promo code TIRE to get 10% off any Blackview dash cam. Free shipping for orders over $200. So that's B-L-A-C-K-V-U-E, Blackview dot com slash T-S-T. ST and use promo code TIRE to get 10% off any Blackview dash cam. Free shipping on orders over $200. All right, guys, today we're back in studio. Zach and I uh, are going over some things. I did 1,200 miles in the Audi S3. We also drove the CT5V Blackwing. Zach's BMW M3 had some mechanical issues, but he went skiing in Tahoe. Uh, hopefully did not come back with the COVID. And uh, we have also had some seat time in a new amazing resto modded classic mini from Gildred Racing. Plus, uh, we are taking your questions. It's a cruise show on the Smoking Tire Podcast. Hey, folks. Welcome to the program. Zach and I in studio, back in studio after my my road trip. Zach went skiing, broke himself a little bit. Possibly. Possibly. I went on a 1,200-mile drive, broke myself lightly, um, not because the car was uncomfortable, but just... 1,200 miles in four days by yourself, that's a lot. That's a ton. It's a lunch. It's a lot of driving. Um, but uh, here we are. Thaddeus has just arrived from Dubai. He's napping on my couch in my office. For good. Yes. For good. We can't say why, I don't think. But We can probably say why, like, next week. Yeah. Um, but it's he got a job. He got, he a, got job. a job. He got a job. And the most important thing about that job is that it's in America. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's had a job for five years, but it was in a different country. Last when he last time when Thad was here, and he came to, uh, we got invited to go to, to dinner with the Lotus people, the Lotus folks who were on on our show in November. They invited us to a dinner at an Italian restaurant, and I was like, Thad, he's come to this dinner with me, and he came, and another member of the automotive media was there. And discussions were had at the dinner. Intros were made at the dinner. I want to be like De Niro in Casino. At least tell me. At least admit I was at the dinner. Was I at that dinner? Was I at the was dinner? Was I at that dinner? Was I in the? Oh, you! Oh, you were in the building. You were in the. Yeah, the I was in the building. building. You were in a casino. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was at that dinner, and it was at that dinner that we made uh, pre-arrangements for for Thaddeus to be returned to America. Matchmakered. Mm-hmm. And so he got a J-O-B, and in a matter of like six days, packed his fucking shit and uh, dipped out a Dubizzle. Yeah, it happened fast. Yeah. It's great. Gave his boss the old fucking what have yous. <laughs> I'm gone. I'm out. <laughs> and, uh, and and we picked him up at the airport in, in a black wing because it's America! As you do. Right. You burned 40 gallons of gas between here and the airport. Right. Well, it's important to pick someone up in something with... The last time he was here, it was the TRX. 
So we have exclusively 700 horsepower airport pickup vehicles. Supercharged only. Only supercharged, but, but it was also a Cadillac that held four suitcases, one of which was a snowboarding bag with the fold-down seats. Yeah. So I guess we could dive into uh, to that, right? Blackwing? We should talk Blackwing. Blackwing. This is nice. Very good. Blackwing is fucking nice. Yeah. Everybody should buy one. I mean, you really should just buy one. Like, why... What are the reasons not to buy a CT5V Blackwing? Fuel's expensive. Uh, yeah. I, and insurance is probably kind of expensive. Probably. But, ooh, you know what? That's a good question. Like, if you buy a Taycan, yeah. do the insurance companies know what the kilowatts mean in terms of power? Or do they just go, oh, it's an EV? Like, I wonder how they classify it. Or do they just look at the, the cost? I'm sure they know how, how expensive it is. I so, don't think... to that point... I don't think, per se, that a Taycan is more expensive than a, a Mach-E because it goes faster. I think it's because it's four times the price. So, if the I wonder with the, if the Blackwing, you know, they know how much it costs. Do they know... That it's fast or that it's a performance car. Or is it they just definitely know sedan? it's a performance car. I mean, they definitely know that. Mm. Um, I don't know. Should we call and try and get an insurance quote on one? And just see like what it is versus a uh, versus a know, non CT4 or yeah. the regular CT5. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a really good car. It's it's what you want it to be. Like it, it really is exactly what you want it to be. Yeah, it lives up to the name and the hype and the weight and all that shit. Yeah, and it's it's. At least in the first like four days or whatever we've had it, it feels like it's built pretty well. You know, things are screwed together tightly. The seats are really, you know, American car seats trail behind the Europe. You know, even the best American car seats are not typically as good as what you'd find in Porsche or Mercedes. Mm -hmm. These get pretty damn close. Like from a materials and structure perspective, these seats are pretty excellent. Um, I did notice that the the heat heating and cooling isn't quite as powerful as I've seen in some other cars, but nevertheless, like they're really sculpted. They're at least as well sculpted as the BMW M4 or the the 911, you know, the, or the Panamera seats. Um, I think they are. I think I'd agree with that. Uh, yeah, especially if you adjust. I forgot the bolsters are all adjustable. Yeah. So when I first got in, I was like, this is kind of a flat bottom seat. But then oh, no, once but you tighten you can, it in. You can mend, yeah, yeah. And then it's you just can, as good. And it's got massage in it, too. And I really like the design of the seats. I like the stitching. Yeah. Like all that top area that's all just like weird creative diamonds. Yeah. They look cool. They're carbon backed. More importantly, you know, 670 horsepower manual gearbox. This is the last. I mean, I suppose the M3 would be considered a luxury sedan with a manual gearbox. Uh, this is certainly bigger than that, um, although not that much heavier. It's a couple hundred pounds heavier, mm -hmm. but it's it's a lot bigger. It's got a much bigger back seat yeah. than the M3. Oh, yeah. It's also not heinous. Yeah. Uh, you should definitely, there should be points for it not being heinous. I think that, the front's really cool looking. The front's great, really great. And actually, I think the back is really nice. The C pillar is probably the weakest part of it because it's the same design you see on like the new Civic. Um, but I think it's better in person than it is. I saw you type Black Wong. Wang. Black Wang. Black I did, Wang. I totally by accident. Black Wang. Um, the C pillar is probably the weakest part because it's got that weird like black thing in the Hofmeister kink of Maximas a bit, you know. Yeah, it's just yeah, it's not a great divot there. But it's better, I think. It's better that they have that kink there with a lower shoulder hot line. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It doesn't have like gun slit windows. You know the the side windows are pretty big. You can rest your elbow on. It's not like a. You know, like a Chrysler 300 gun slit window. Yeah, where it's so high. Where it's, it's really kind of high. Useless. You don't feel like you're sitting in a cave. Um, and it's uh, obviously it's fucking fast. I mean, it's really fucking fast, right? You know, like any other car with a manual gearbox, right? The 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 acceleration numbers don't do justice to how fast it really is, right? I mean, obviously, objectively, I think the M5 CS will beat it by a couple, a tenth or something in the quarter mile, and maybe like three or four miles an hour. And obviously, the Tesla Plaid and the Taycan Turbo S will will beat it in a, the EVs, the really really fast EVs will beat it in a quarter mile. Mm -hmm. I would bet 
a substantial amount of money that the Black Wing would house any of those EVs around the Nurburgring. House. Oh, yeah. Like, I agree. Embarrass. Like I think it would be a it enormous a thousand gap. pounds less. It would be basically. an enormous gap around mm-hmm. the Nurburgring, and I also, if you look at, um, you know, Car and Driver did like a RS7 M5 competition black wing comparison test the in gear acceleration like the 50 to 70 yeah. that sort of highway pass the the black wing housed the m5 and the rs7 in that despite being you know manual but it makes more power than both of those things more power yeah. less weight yeah. so you know the shifts will slow you down the fact that there's eight you know six gears in the manual instead of eight or nine or fucking 10 in the automatic or infinite in the EVs, you know, shift times will slow you down. So the numbers don't do justice to to how fast this thing is to actually get in and drive. It's yeah. fucking fast. Like if you if you just took a tenth for each shift, which is incredibly quick. Mm-hmm. But if you just put that into four shifts, it's like, all right, well now you're four tenths behind something that doesn't have to shift or yeah. shifts instantly. Yeah. But it's so good. Yeah. It's so good. You know, really wide power band. You, if you're just cruising around, you never have to rev it past three grand ever. Yeah. Um, you know, tons and tons of torque down low. Um, you can drive it super mellow. The ride is excellent. You know, the Camaro ZL1 was like a ZL1 1LE. It was like an incredible powertrain, but it, it was darty. You know, it beat the shit out of you. It had these crazy shocks that were like for rage. This is like that powertrain, but even more with like a luxury car wrapped around it. It's what you want it to be. It's more It's more like the ZL1, which was a little bit softer, had mag ride and stuff, but uh, with four doors and more space. Yeah. And it's nicer looking inside and outside, I think. The ZL1 was very simple because yeah. it was a Camaro. Yeah. And, you know, this costs more money, but it's really great. And by not having Q anymore, there's no more terrible haptic touch buttons. You know, the touch screen works well. The CarPlay is wireless, it works well. There's wireless charging, wireless CarPlay. That climate control buttons are real buttons. You know, there's a lot of, um, there's just, there's good design. There's obvious attention paid to dynamics. I mean, so much attention paid to dynamics. The brake feel and the steering feel and the pedal and the, the throttle response and the shift feel and all that stuff. But then there's not a ton of extra frou-frou in terms of like fanciness for fancy's sake. You know, the RS7 was like a Tron nightclub in there. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It doesn't have that. Right. Um, the, the, the BMW... Um, I haven't I haven't been an M5, but the five series, you know, everything is like buried in these menus. Um, this doesn't really have that. It's easier to get to stuff, um, and it's not as digital as the the last BMW M5 I drove. It's much much more engaging, but and and analog, but in not in a way that is tiring. You know, it's I th- good. I think the. The German products, usually when I, I drive them, like you look around in them and I, I feel like they're meant to make you go, ooh, look at all this nice stuff. And like yeah. The design of the speaker metal is usually really interesting, especially in the later M5. It, it, it's shaped different and those holes are drilled. Like everything, it needs to look special because they need to separate themselves, right? Here, it looks nice. And like you said, it looks put together well, but there's plenty of places where like they didn't have the budget to make it look fancy, but at least they made it simple and functional. Yeah. And it's funny, like I didn't think about it until until today that Q seemed like one of the earliest entrants into the capacitive button field and everyone hated it. And all the other companies for some reason in the last five years are like, no, 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 we we can make it work. You know, like we can make Cold Fusion real (laughs) and it's not working out for anybody. No, our NFTs are real. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Our NFTs are totally legit and not at all a scam. Exactly, (laughs) exactly, yeah. And uh, I'm glad they're gone here. It's all, it's like everything is a button or a knob and that's Except it. for the couple of things that need to be on the touchscreen. Oh, yeah. I'm yeah. not mad about that. Right, right. Even the touchscreen, like, there's a knob for scrolling volume, and there's a knob to tune the radio. Like, that's cool. And there's a, a physical home button as well. Like, th- those things should be that way. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's really, um, like, uh, uh, so many good decisions were made. Yeah. And even though... There are certain like there's what you call the a the a touch points like the steering wheel and the shifter, the the dashboard, the console, right? That's like the a touch points. The b touch points, 
which is like the deep, deep back of the dashboard and like the bottoms of the doors, mm -hmm. those aren't, they're not wrapped in leather. You know True. what I mean? So they, um, whereas like the RS7, those, those will, or, or the Porsche, like those will be covered in the same A-level materials that the, you know what I mean, that the A-touch points are. Right, so in here they have it. So it's they've they've made it. It's thirty thousand dollars cheaper than the soup the German super sedans. Thirty thousand dollars, like that's like so many track days. That's a really baller vacation. A really baller vacation. Yeah, that's you, that's you know a lifetime of maintenance. You know, for a or or it's oh, eh, computer done is done with something. Making progress. That's a uh, that that's like how many years of insurance? You know, is thirty thousand dollars. It's a lot. And also, let's not like AMGs, RSs, and M and BMW M cars. They depreciate. Mm -hmm. They have regular. In fact, they depreciate more than supercars. They depreciate more than Corollas. They, oh, they're yeah. among the highest types of depreciation. Maybe today's market is a little different, yeah, but it's kind of an anomaly. And traditionally, they depreciate. You know what doesn't depreciate? Manual CTSVs. You got a 2012 CTSV, 2009 to 2012 CTSV, especially a wagon. If you bought it new and you put 40,000 miles on it between then and now, you get every penny back today. Every single penny you put into that car comes right back to you you if you had a 2012 m5 i assure you you're not getting every penny back totally especially because this is the last it's the most powerful it's the last it's the only one of its kind yeah 2014 bmw m5 44 000 bucks i mean a 2014 bmw m5 probably is worth less than a 2009 ctsv Manual, probably. I mean, yeah. that's like a half or a third of what this car's MSRP was, depending mm -hmm. on the spec. Mm -hmm. That is brutal. I mean, it's, and it's not unexpected for you know German luxury cars. Well, it's but. not expected for any car, for any new car. That's just regular old depreciation. But manual CTSVs are exempt, right? Because the, I think things that enthusiasts love that are special, yeah, they hold their value. The M, uh, the one M did it. Um, and these will probably do it as well because it's it's the last V8 they're going to put in cars, according to Cadillac. Meaning, plus sedans. it's definitely the last manual transmission full size car. Pro well, not definitely, but probably. Um, you know, it's rear wheel drive, not all wheel drive. It has all the things that make it collectible. Yes, um, and that's so why I think it's a better buy. The mileage sucks, and that's just what happens when you have a lot of horsepower. Yeah, but thirty thousand bucks gets you buys you a lot of gas. It does it? buy you a lot of gas. Um, I mean, you know, it, it's wasteful and it's, it pollutes more than. It blah, sucks, blah, but like, it doesn't suck that much worse. The well, the RS seven with its its mild hybrid might not be so bad, but the RS seven is nowhere near as exciting to drive. As well, this. And, not, and I mean, the M five gets fifteen city, which is better than this one by like forty percent, but it's not good. It's not, we're not talking mid 20s. Yeah. Um, but I think. The E63 gets horrible fuel economy. Yeah. It's it, really bad. And it's heavy. And, yeah. you know, I mean, they're, they're all going to get bad fuel economy, but this is the one that, that will remain special because I think they're going to keep making the small displacement turbocharged engines with quick transmissions and all that shit. They're going to keep making that for a long time. You know, and then if, and yeah, you could get a Taycan for this price, but one, people aren't cross shopping them. But two, quick EVs are like just getting started. Like all that shit's going to exist for a really long time. And this is not. Yeah, but it, and they did a good job at it too. It's like, yeah, I mean, I mean none it. of those. It's the last. It's the you know, none of those like attributes would matter if it was a piece of shit, right? You know, but it's not. You're not going to the retirement party just because they're retiring. You're like, yeah, no, no, yeah. I like this person. Yeah, I mean, it turns in great, and the and the ride around town is amazing. Like, they did their homework, and we fit a. T I just picked up Thad with like. The things he moved back here with, like four <laughs> huge suitcases and a snowboard bag, the rear seats folded down. It's 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 not impractical. Yeah, you know it is. Yes, it is wasteful when it comes to fuel, but that bad fuel economy does translate directly to performance. And the other things about it are so good that I can forgive it that sin. 
I wouldn't recommend it as a, you know, if, if you're daily driving it in a traffic jam, if you're commuting in a major city, it's probably not the right car. Right. Especially with a stick. Clutch is kind of heavy. I mean, it's not brutally heavy, but it's 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 kind of heavy. Um, in the grand scheme of clutches, you know, the Civic SI is on one end, and this is this is on the other end or closer to the other end. Um, you'd have old vintage cars to right. go beyond yeah, yeah. that for sure. But but <clears throat> but um, if you're somewhere where the gas is cheap, if you're somewhere where there's not a lot of traffic, clicking off a lot of miles. Or if your commute is a windy, a windy road, you know it's hard to justify it as as a weekend sports car because it's big. You know what I mean? It doesn't, it doesn't feel, it does feel special, but it's not. It doesn't feel special in the way I would want my weekend sports car to feel special. But it is like a great place to spend. Well, I think it's it's time. hard to. It's hard to justify any fast sedan as a weekend sports car mm -hmm. because they carry so many people and you're like, well, that's what I do during the week. But I think we all love fast sedans. I mean, I do because you can carry people and you can share that experience with more people and you can put shit in it, which is helpful. Like, you know, if your sports car is too small, then it's it can only be used for a certain number of things. Yeah. But I, I do understand what you mean. Like, if you're gonna just go rip canyons, it's gonna feel heavy. It'll be fast, but it's gonna feel different than something that weighs. 3,300 pounds. Yeah. You know, but they're, I, but fast sedans have always just been so cool. Just that they're fun and they got like a hoon element to them. And this thing has that in spades for sure. If you miss the E39 M5, right. Just go straight to this. Exactly. You know, or buy, you know, because a great E39 M5 is now going to cost you 85,000 bucks. <laughs> that's a good a point. great one. Yeah. I mean, a really, really great one. Like from EAG, like a great one. Mm -hmm. That's $85,000. Which is where these Which start. is where this car starts. Yeah. And this has a warranty. Yeah. The one we drove was 105, but it had ceramic brakes, extended carbon fiber, you know, red seat belts, a bunch of shit. It mm -hmm. had a bunch of shit on it. Um, the carbon packages are like five grand, and just, just for like the this the, one only the had one carbon ours. level one. Okay, that, yeah, they're. Expensive. I don't know what other thing would be carbon. Um, they add more carbon for the rear diffuser and under oh, diffuser. Okay, and um, there's a couple other bits. You and I, I checked the configurator last night. Like you can do carbon package one and two at the same time because they they give you carbon on different things. Right. But this one looked cool without. I think you have to do carbon package one to get, to get carbon two. package two. Got to pass that level. Yeah. Meet that boss. But Carbon Package 1 was still a bunch of carbon. It was. It was a lot. And, and mostly the big trunk one, which I think looks a little aggressive, just because I think the rest of the car is so good looking. But, you know, it does make downforce. Like, yeah. you need that shit. And even at hundred and five grand, you are not even at the base price of the other super sedans. Right. The other super sedans are like a plus 20 base yep. over this. Yep. Yeah. So you're you're getting the performance of the M5 and then some for the the cost of the M3. Yeah, that's basically. very true. And it's not heinous. And it's and you can look at the front of it yeah. every day. If you think the C pillar is not good in this, you should see the front of the M3. <laughs> <laughs> Wait till I tell you about that. You see so few of them. I yeah. really think that's why. I really think that's why. Yeah, ugly's ugly, man. I know. Uh, Peter Nam uh, from Gunther Works, you know, they also own Vorsteiner. Mm -hmm. That's that's the same company. So they make carbon. That's that's their thing. Their thing is making carbon body panels. And so he sent me some renderings going, I think I might have unfucked the front of the M4. And he sends me, and I had no choice but to say, Peter, it's better. He put he puts, the, there's a bumper that goes through the middle of the bear, beaver teeth. Right. But it's still... It's still awful, and it, and I go, you got, you have to get rid of the bottom half of the beaver teeth, and he said you can't because you can't. the engine needs the yep. cooling. There's a lot of radiators down yeah. there, yeah, and so it's it's impossible to unfuck it. Someone did a rendering of like the just the old F80 bumper on it, and that looked great. And I was like, what about just making old F80 bumpers? He's like, it won't work. The car will overheat in like five minutes. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they they have a lot of heat exchangers for that thing. Yeah. That's that's a tough break. Yep. That's a real tough break. That's a tough break. You're stuck with an ugly car. It's unfortunate. Yeah, because the car's good. It drives And the well. manual in this is way better than the BMW, the BMW's current manual. For sure. It feels much better. It feels yeah. way more direct without being too heavy. Like, it's it's the sweet spot. It's yeah. a Tremec. It's a good one. It is. I yeah. think they, they don't get enough credit for building a very nice shifter. It's a very nice, very nice shifter. It's six-speed. It's not a seven-speed. 
doesn't have an extra gate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, six the, gear, is, the gears feel very six tall. Six is the right number. Very tall. Well, it's tall gearing... Y- Tall gearing matters less when you've got 660 pounds of torque to of play with. You know, you were the most of the canyons were ripping with second and third. Third goes to like a third might even go as high as like 90. I think it does. Which actually is sh- is shorter than the GT4, isn't it? The GT4 third goes to 114. Wow, that's yeah. funny. Considering really the tall. power this has versus the GT4. Yeah. yeah, that's why we complain about the GT4. Well, the CT5 was developed here, and I think the GT4 was developed in Germany. They have different uh, noise and emissions laws. It was the it was that third gear full throttle thing. Right, it can't be too loud. Mm-hmm. So anyway, um, honestly, the video you'll 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 see in the video, but can't recommend uh, Blackwing highly enough. That is. It has $105,000 very well spent. Yes. Anybody who gets one of those. Uh, who was I just talking to? My friend Pete Brotman, who's in town. Uh, he hangs out on the East Coast with Michael Strahan. You know him? The football player? The football player. Oh, on, wow. Who's on TV now. Yeah. Big car collector. A lot of random stuff. Not all modern supercars. He's got a 928. He's got some old 911s. He said he got a Blackwing, and it is, it is his favorite car right now. Yeah. Which is not surprising. It fucking rips. It's really fast, but it's also, you know, if you don't get it in electric blue like we have, is very understated. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's not super loud unless you're flooring it everywhere. They um, did, the sound editing for the inside is really good. Like yeah. when you get on it, it's I think it's the right amount of volume, you know, for what I want from a car that's pretty refined to drive. But you're yeah. very aware that you have the power. I think out when I started it in your garage to leave the cold start. Yeah. You have a little bit of a megaphone effect there, but holy shit! Yeah, cold start is uh, windows down. It cold you know. starts aggro. Yeah, yeah, it's okay though. I don't mind. A, I don't mind an old aggro cold start. No, it's, it sounds like a vet with uh, exhaust on it. You just yeah, blah, 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 blah. yeah, yeah it does. It's not like an F type. No, no, no. It's not, or it's not as bad as that SRT Jeep. That that was very aggressive cold start. But this is uh, this is good. It's a good amount of car. Good car. Yeah, the people who built it care very much about driving dynamics. Um, GM performance. They know. They know what the fuck is going on. Definitely. Sure. Uh, I also did 1,200 miles in the uh, the Audi S3. Did I post a picture of it? There it is. Um, drove it up north. I'm uh, leading the Road and Track Route to Vine uh, rally, which has 15 cars signed up for it. Uh, some are true supercars. There's two Ferrari 812s uh, signed up. Nice. There's a couple fast sedans, and there's like two like uh, GTIs. So there's a good. There's a spread. Um, I think they're taking up to 25 cars. Um, you can go to roadandtrack.com/experiences if you'd like to sign up for yourself. So I made the route, um, and I went to go drive it and reality check it in the Audi S3. Uh, starts in Golden Gate Park over the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, do some windies up uh, by um, uh, Lucas, uh, what's Lucas Films? Uh, Skywalker Ranch up there by um, uh, Nicasio, up up there down to Sonoma Raceway where we'll be doing some uh, auto crossing and hot lapping at Sonoma Raceway. And then we go drive some more canyons up and over Mount Veeder. It was my first time doing that road. That road was Really, very tight and technical, very cool. Uh, then down into Yauntville, where which is where there's like mad five star restaurants, all the wines down there. Uh, we're staying at Hotel Yauntville, and uh, then we go drive up. Uh, the next day, we do a lap around uh, Lake Berryessa. I don't know if you've ever been up to Lake mm-hmm. Berryessa. It's the roads were kick ass. It was beautiful uh, up there, and uh, then we come over come back over the mountain. Uh, yeah, Lake Barrier is Lake Berryessa. I think that's how you pronounce it. So the see the, see the road that runs along the western side there? Oh, that yeah. that road is uh, is beautiful. It's fan- that's a fantastic road. So the the whole mountain in between there and Pope Valley on the left to the west of there, the, those roads through there, fantastic. So cool. we're going to cruise over there uh, back to the Oh, the Auberge de Soleil, which is like a five-star, uh, you know, resort. Some wine tasting, and then down south, uh, back through the Golden Gate, and down Skyline, pretty much all the way down Skyline to um, 
not Santa Cruz, Scotts Valley, mm-hmm. where uh, Canapa is. Cool. So that's the that's pretty much the route. Um, there's some great back roads. It's a really fun drive. It's very scenic and pretty and amazing. So the S3 was, I found it to be very delightful. Um, it's MQB, MQB, so it's it's you know almost as nice as a Volkswagen Golf gets. You know the RS3 is going to be a little bit more powerful with the five cylinder. Mm-hmm. This is this has the Golf R engine, the 300 horsepower, um, 200 two liter, huh? two two, liter. Yeah. two liter, seven speed DSG. But the seats were basically the same seats as the RS5, um, although. If you put them all the way back, it does eat into the rear seat room quite a lot. It's got tons of front seat room. Remember how Camisa was talking about how the 190E Cosworth Mercedes, like one of the goals with the 190 was that it had the same front seat room as an S-Class? Yeah. This is like that. Wow. So it has the same front seat room as the, as the RS5 Sportback, which was like almost double the price. Which also had basically the same seat room as the RS7. Yeah. Wow. It has a ton wow. of room in the front. The steering wheel was great. The driving position was great. Um, the uh, the infotainment and the car play was really good. Although I had one hiccup where it it didn't like... at one For some reason, it just didn't recognize it at one point. I had to stop and restart it. Um, I also had one point where the front radar sensor through an error code and and then it just fixed itself like an hour later so i'm not sure about that um those are things that i told the press fleet guy and that i don't know if they represent issues that are model wide or or if it's just this one car or what um i did ex- i that that was a little frustrating but dynamically very nice all-wheel drive was very sure-footed uh, plenty of grip. You, I drove it in a lot of rain. I mean, it rained every single day. I drove it though. You, I apologize in, a, in advance. The car is filthy in the video. I washed it three times. Wow. Being like, I gotta film it. I gotta wash it. I'll film it. Wash. And then it just kept fucking raining. I yeah, kept driving it for a week. It rained for a week straight. I washed it three times, and then I just gave up. I was like, I, I can't do this anymore. And so I filmed it dirty. Sorry. Um, How does the steering feel? Pretty good. Okay. Light. But not like the GTI is so light. It wasn't that light. And if you put it in dynamic, you could feel it get heavier. I didn't really push the limits of grip. You know, I, I drove it within the limits of grip. But the car is really small and it's really easy to place. And I like, I like that. Um, I found it to be fun um, and engaging. Uh, I liked the automatic gearbox programming sometimes I, I rarely leave these cars in automatic when I'm in canyons but mm-hmm. I, I left it in sport auto for a couple times and I was like oh this actually is doing a, doing a very nice job of predicting when I want to go down a gear and, and managing torque and stuff like that if you put it in manual it would bang the rev limiter it wouldn't shift up um, when you just hit rev limiter which I liked uh, even with traction control off it still was very sure footed the different the different drive you know i drove it with um the powertrain in pretty aggressive and the suspension the optional um adjustable suspension suspension and soft and then the the steering in medium and then the the powertrain in aggro that's kind of how i liked it the exhaust note was a little fake i don't know if it's speakers or exactly what but it's it's pretty fake sounding it doesn't do the farting but it it feels like something's being pumped into the cabin that is not happening outside the car. The trade-off is it's refined. You know, you're cruising it, allegedly, 90 or 100 miles an hour, 110 miles an hour sometimes, just cruising, eating up miles, and psh, easy. Very, very easy. Brakes were good. Um, you might, I don't know if I don't know if they would hold up to track day work without pads and fluid, but for street, totally fine. And it was like just a nice place to spend all those time and miles. It's just nice. It's a good well-rounded car if you can do a road trip and do some canyon stuff. Yeah. And it's not letting you down and it's helping you. It's being a good friend to actually suss out are these good driving roads. It would have been perfect for that coastal range rally. It would have mm-hmm. been the perfect car for that. Yeah. It was, um, you know, it had the upgraded Napa leather, which was like 600 bucks, which made it feel like an Audi. You know, you got to get the, you have to get some of those options. You have to get you the do. good infotainment. You get the virtual cockpit, and you get the 
uh, the Napa leather, and all of a sudden it, it feels like an Audi and not just like an overly styled Volkswagen. Right. So this thing was like fifty six thousand dollars. It was it was on the higher end. This is the Prestige, which is like the highest one. Um, but for that, you know, it's LED lights, it's radar cruise, it's autom you know automatic rain sensing wipers and all this extra luxury stuff that makes you feel like you're in a small luxury car and not just like a overly not a styled GTI sedan or something yeah, yeah. i mean cuz what you have you know when you have platform sharing with MQB and it starts with a $21,000 golf and goes all the way up to a $55,000 car the it's easy, and Camisa said this. It's e you know, it's easy for to just tart a, tart it up and go. See, we made it nicer. But in fairness, it's also I find small luxury cars if they're if they feel like luxury cars to be nice. You know, if it's just a Mercedes CLA two hundred and fifty that doesn't really feel like a Mercedes because it's front wheel drive and it's buzzy or whatever it feels kind of cheap i go oh, all right but they made this one and the one i tested with the really nice materials the all-wheel drive the refinement it, they gave it the things that made me go this is an audi it's not surprising i mean when i drove the golf r my only real complaints about it were the steering feel was just basically non-existent but as a grand touring car like it was very comfortable. Yeah, I thought the displays were good. I thought the ride was good. It's quiet. Like it, it felt like an upmarket experience. And so if they take that and then elevate it even more, it makes total sense. Yeah, yeah. It there was a lot to like about it. There really was. And, and I, most of the time, I don't need. I need a back seat. This is just me talking, but I, I need to put someone in the back seat once a month, not every day. Right. People have their own priorities. I, I get it. Shop for your for, shop for your own priorities. But if you want a car that feels like an Audi, but you don't want to lug all that extra space around for the one time a month you have to put someone in the back, don't buy the bigger one. It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, like a, a twin turbo six, I guess, sounds better than a turbo four. I guess. I don't, but I don't think. But like not. The RS5 but it wasn't didn't special. Like special. Yeah, it not wasn't special. Yeah. I liked how the RS5 looked, but yeah, I don't need I a sedan that big to lug myself around. You know, if it's just me, get the little one. Mm -hmm. It was easy to park. It's easy to just stick it somewhere. Really sharp turning radius. Um, can maneuver within the lane. Very maneuverable. I liked it. Cool. It was really nice. Felt like an Audi. It didn't it? Didn't I felt there's a little bit of MQB that you are never going to escape. Once you've driven a couple of MQB cars, you can recognize the platform. But that's a it takes a pretty sensitive touch to right to be like, oh yeah, MQB, it's a Volkswagen. If you're not a Camisa or a me or a you, if you're just a person shopping for a car, in ninety-five ways out of a hundred, this thing feels like a small Audi, not an overstyled Volkswagen. Which I think is pretty good. Good. Yeah. I mean that's what we want. I like Audis. Yeah, so that's the S3. I enjoyed it. I have a video. Uh, what will be Monday? Monday tomorrow. S3. No, no, you're doing. Are we doing just the noise? The Gunther works tomorrow. Oh yeah. Audi Audis will be uh, Monday morning. So uh, that's that. Right, and uh, go to roadandtrack.com/slash/experiences if you would like to uh, sign up for that. Also, while I was on that road trip, I recorded podcasts with Mike Musto and with Jason Camisa. And if you're wondering why the video is blown out with Jason Camisa, it's because he was very sensitive about showing where he lived. And uh, you, you can identify where he lives if you can see the view from his backyard. And so we blew out the, the video in the backyard so you can't see. That was he, – he was concerned about his privacy, and rightly so. When you say controversial things, you don't necessarily want people to know where you live. So um, that podcast is is, uh, is up now, so mm -hmm. check that out. Um, I thought that was a really, really interesting show. I love hanging out with Camisa. Yeah. And obviously the – we recorded it outside on a Yeti mic with no producer, so it's not studio sound, but it's, it's fine. It sounded pretty good. 
Yeah. Considering we're like outside mm-hmm. with a with a Yeti mic, it was fine. That thing totally with the, fine. Uh, with the hair on it does a really good job of mitigating the wind. Totally yeah. decent. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, for a portable, fairly shanty rig, it works j- absolutely fine. I was not about to bring that whole. I can't even operate that whole board. I, know. I don't even know That's what I'm how doing. I keep my job. Yeah. <laughs> I don't tell doing? you how to operate the thing. <laughs> yeah, it's the best way to keep your job. Don't yeah. tell me too much. I took all the labels off of all the controls, <laughs> and then I'll forget. I don't know how to do anything. Uh, Zach tried to go drifting. I sure as fuck did. Tried. I how did. many drifts did you do? Uh, four very short sessions. So, yeah. you know, at Apple Valley, they paved. They have a skid pad now. It's not very big. It's definitely way smaller than the Will- Willow Springs one, but they had set up a cone course. Um you know, a lot like Naoki set up a Drift 101, where it's like, here's a long sweeping turn into a tight right, or depending on what direction you're going, you know, tight right, and then a donut. Yeah. And so you can go, and they and you just go out there and fuck around for basically as long as you want. There's like a line of cars there. And so the first time I went out, I put on the Braveris whatever I have, like the 500 treadwear drift oh, tires. Oh, you're hard tires. Hard right. tires. And I had them at 45 PSI. And it was 37 degrees, dude. It was it was ice covered in mud. I mean, I I like everything I can normally do to like correct and catch a slide. And it just looped, and I went back in. And I dropped it down to 35, and then it was fine. Then it was normal. And it just felt like sliding a normal car. Um, and new the new suspension and sway bars like completely change how that car feels drifting because mm. it used to. I mean, it, or if you're like if you took your car sliding, it's gonna like lean and then it steps out and it's really communicative and it feels very natural in a slide but when you want to transition it's kind of lazy because it it feels heavy and soft and you can feel the whole body tilt uh-huh. and then settle and then it breaks loose and now it's like it feels like one of the 240 sx's with coils that naoki has where it's just like you know you're you're sliding right and then you just lift and throw it left and it just locks in like real quick so i was very happy with mm. that um so I did four little sessions and then started hearing a tick. Like windows are down. Like tick, 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 Yeah, just like coming from the front. And I was like, oh, that's weird. So it almost sounded like I'd blown a tire already and it was like whipping in the back. So I pull in and I check the tires and they're fine. I'm like, well, that's not great. So I turn it on and I listen under the hood and it's like, it kind of sounds like a little tick is coming from the Vano system, the variable cam timing system. So that's not great. Um, so I put the code reader on it, and it has two codes related to the Venos. I clear them, turn the car off, turn the car back on, let it run for a bit, check the codes again, and they stay and they stay gone. Uh-huh. And I'm like, okay, maybe it was a weird fluke. Maybe it was like I checked the oil, top it off a tiny bit, but that wasn't really a problem. And then Sarah, my incredibly patient girlfriend, had skipped going to a New Year's party. So that we could go sleep at a Holiday Inn in Victorville to go drifting because you know we have to be there at eight thirty in the morning in Apple Valley, and so I was gonna let her drive and she helped carry the tires and she helped mount the shit like she did all the things I did, and I put her in the driver's seat and we pull out to like the donut spot and you can hear it again and like and so we just we both look at each other we pull back in and. I did like the screwdriver trick where you put the screw the handle of your screwdriver to your ear and then you touch the end of the screwdriver to parts of the engine. That's how you can like I'm listen. I'm sorry, what? So, it, you know, if you open your hood and you hear like a ticking sound, uh-huh. you go, where is this coming from? So you basically can make a stethoscope, you know, by holding a screwdriver against your ear, the handle, not yeah, the pointy yeah. part. And then if you touch the pointy part to parts of the engine. Really? Yeah. Oh, I've never heard so, of this before. So, you know, if you, if you want to listen to like your valves are ticking, but if you, if you put that end of the screwdriver over on the header, you're not going to hear the sound as much. Uh Or on the block, you're like, okay, it's not rod knock. So you can find where it's coming from. How interesting. So I did that on the Vano system, and it's like, it was not as loud as that yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I just made the call. I was like, I don't think we should slide anymore. And her face, so crestfallen for like, (sighs) I mean, and I get it, like for a day. She was like, we went out there, and I didn't get to do the thing. I'm like, I feel so bad. And normally, I'm not that responsible, but I was like, if we blow this thing up, but you drove, yeah, because you stuck. drove your drift car. I'm the only one who drove their drift car. Yeah, <laughs> these guys are like, which car is yours? They're like, oh, it's that E46. They're like, oh, that's nice. They're like, okay, gutsy. Yeah, like one, one guy was like, that's bold. Um, <laughs> so we drove back, and I and I called Mark you made Norris it home. and made it home. Called Mark Norris, and he's like, oh, it sounds like your Veno solenoid, which is just a computer chip that sits on it. Those are known for going bad in the cars. Like they, the connections get loose. And you either get them repaired or you get a new one. 
And so I ordered a new one. He's like, you can change it in five minutes in your driveway. So I'm going to change that and then take it to him to listen and have the people that know what they're doing, like, listen to it, do a valve adjustment, because I need one of those anyway. That sounds expensive. It is. Yeah. Um, it is. Supposed to do it every 30,000 miles, he said. And you like, are? Yeah. I was like, well, my last one was at like 80, so <laughs> I'm due. And, and I'm just going to be like, listen to it, tell me what the condition of the Venus is in, like, what should I do to make it a little bit more reinforced. The quest for Zach to bulletproof this car oh continues God. because, you know, the back set and the fucking cooling system is fine, but, you know, there's always something. I can't, I have, I, uh, someone, I don't know who, someone sent me a neon BMW check engine light sign. God sent that to you. That's who sent it. Maybe they meant to send it to you. They, I have enough of them. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they just wanted to tell Mine me what to listen. I don't know I who you are. That. I don't know who sent this to me. Yeah. But like, it's weird because whoever sent it sent it to my home and as opposed to the shop mm -hmm. like this address is publicly available anyone could send anything here right but like uh, someone who knows the my home address sent this thing there was no card but they have a good sense of humor too so well yeah, yeah they i mean it's but i went through my my short list of people that it would have been right and it wasn't so i don't know i don't know i uh, think it, i think it's great I, when you you were like, did you send maybe me this as a God, gift? Yeah. I was like, I wish I had because yeah. it's fucking genius. It's really funny, it's but really maybe funny. it was just God. Oh, I, I hope know. it's the only check engine light you ever see. I finally got plates for my car. It took. Uh, I went to the DMV, and as and it was early, and they they opened at eight. I got there at seven twenty. Had a big jug of coffee, standing outside. I was the fifth person in line, and we. I went into the door of the DMV. You know, the way the DMV works in California, if you don't know, is there's, I guess, there's letters A through G, and depending on what you're there for, they assign you one of those letters. B. Basketball. I, I don't, I thought B was for registering shit. That's what, because I, but the guy next to me, this guy was like 90. <laughs> this story is going somewhere. This guy was like 90. <laughs> I was B003, and he, they gave him B004. Okay. Okay. I, we walked into the DMV, sat down, and then they call you. They call by name, by letter, and number. Okay. They call A001, B001, C001, D, E, G, right? Oh, okay. Whatever, right? 001. Then they called- A2. Yes. But they got to F and G- 22 before they called the next B. Do they forget? I don't fucking know. I don't. And the guy next to me who was like a thousand years old was kind of like, like we're in prison. Like, so what are you in for? You know? And I was like, I'm just trying to register this car. And he's like, what's go? Why don't you go to AAA? I was like, because I bought it from Ohio and you can't register an out of state car using AAA. You have to come to the DMV. And he goes, Oh, are you from Ohio? And I'm, I go, no. And he starts, Talking and then and then the conversation. Took, I've been to Ohio. Yes, before. Yes, basically, yeah. Great potatoes. Nope, it, Idaho. Oh, I used to live in Ohio. The, the the DMV was well more organized. Yeah. Okay. Cool, man. I hear they've got good jobs there. I'm not moving. What do you? I'm just trying to register a car that came from Ohio. I'm not talking about going. They have more corn and we're, in one city so, block than we have in the whole so state. So even though I walked in at. At 8.03 and sat down. I didn't get called. They didn't call B003 until 9.30. I sat there for an hour and 27 minutes between B001 and B003. And the old guy died. The guy, well, so that this guy, he keep once I once he's recognized that I will respond to his musings. After he asked, we talk about Ohio. You can't go anywhere, son. He go then goes, here. let me ask you something. What are you doing on that phone? I go, oh God. <laughs> He wants and I you go, to explain Apple iPhones then. I go, I promise this is getting somewhere. Oh, it's already And good. I go, I go, uh, well, you know, I'm check going doing some emails. Uh, I'm reading some reading some news. I'm just I'm browsing Instagram. And he goes, Instagram. And I go, Yeah, it's social media, you know. He goes, Oh, I've heard of that. Yeah. Yeah, okay. He goes, that's all you're doing? He's like, you've been here for an hour and a half. You do it. That's all you're doing? I go- You got any of that Tinder you can share? I go, we're, I go well, I'm, I'm just sitting here. So, uh, you know, it's a it's a Monday. So I'm, you know, going through my, my work, my emails and whatever. And he goes, oh, I see. I see. All I do with my- <laughs> He goes, I've got one of those smartphones. And I go, oh, yeah? And he goes, all I do with it is buy Bitcoin. 
Bet you didn't think I was going there. Did not. All I do with it is buy Bitcoin, to which I had many questions about how this person has overlooked the iPhone news email and has gone straight to Bitcoin. By the way, the chances that this guy's making any money on Bitcoin are fucking zero. This guy missed the boat on Bitcoin. Okay. But right right as soon as he he goes before i had time to really fully process this old ass guy who can't figure out a smartphone is exclusively using it for buying bitcoin they call my number B-O-O-3. and i fucking <laughs> sprint to window number 16 were you torn cuz you're like i want to hear this guy no, story no i was like now. bye i was over it i was like bye and the story ends on bitcoin and when you buy an iphone <laughs> it walks you through all the functions it has. It's like, look at the music and the news and all these things will do for you. And none of, he didn't do any of those. No, That's but funny. he's figured out Robin Hood oh, okay, <laughs> or, yeah. or whatever, yeah, yeah. whatever the fuck, OpenSea or whatever the fucking Bitcoin buying, <laughs> NFT. Whatever, the, whatever the Bitcoin buying app is. Wow. So, and after that, literally, because I had all my paperwork done, I, after waiting an hour and a half, I handed the paperwork to a guy, he looked at the paperwork for 30 seconds and then handed me license plates and I fucking went left. But like, oh God, what a long morning. That's ridiculous. From there I did went straight to the dentist. about B? I think, I they, think they forgot B. Or like they whoever- They forgot about it 19 times. Whoever was in charge of fucking B was like an hour and a half late to work or something. I, I don't know, but it was fucked up. Was so it, anyway, I have was plates Betty? now. Because then we know why she's late. I have license plates. Oh, man. I was in the grocery store, real quick tangent, and uh, there was like an Us Weekly, and it was Betty White Turns 100 oh, yeah, in they, interview. That they shit went to print. There were two of them. So funny. Did you buy it? No, I just took you photos got, of them. I could buy them. Yeah, yeah, that shit went to it print. It was really funny. Went to print a little early, yep, didn't and it? And then someone got a phone call, and they went, fuck. We forgot to cancel. Fuck. We forgot to cancel Command the Z. print Command on Z. <laughs> All right, so uh, have I done anything else important with cars this week? I don't really believe I have. Um, I don't think so. We drove this. We drove this mini today, mm-hmm. this Gildred Racing Mini. Um, it was a lovely build that was not for me. <laughs> uh, it it uh, it basically they put a bunch of luxury things into a classic mini, and. Somehow, it just, I didn't, fit, you'll see in the video, I just didn't fit in it. It just was not comfortable to drive. It was not easy to drive because it was meant for a very small person, I guess. And and I, that's it. The matte, that's it, right? Yep. Yeah, there it is. Matte black. It's a Super Cooper Sport. Uh, it's got, uh, it's got a, a, a D16. Oh. I thought it was a B16. What's the difference between B and D? I don't know. I don't know. The internet know. will yell. Yeah. It's got a it's got a 1.6 Honda in it, VTEC, and a five speed, and it makes fun sounds, and it's a very very classic mini experience. But I do not fit in it appropriately. Uh, the the inputs were really really weird. It was very hard for me to drive. Well, it was interesting talking to um, Ryan and Nate, the guys that you know part of the team that built it, and this is a later mini, like so I think 70s. But um, they said as they got later, the ergonomics got weirder because they wanted. They added more features, which were all bigger, but they didn't increase the size of the car. Yeah. So it's kind of like the problem we have today where cars keep getting bigger because people want more shit. But with Mini, they were like, we're not making the car bigger. We'll give you the more shit. So yeah. they have this big heater that encroaches on everything and cup holders and all this stuff. And the, so the packaging is just kind of weird. And and the two big problems with the car were the pedals seemed like they'd all been shifted six inches to the right. I yeah. mean, no joke, the gas pedal was in line with... The shifter. It was almost in the center of the car. Yeah. Like not and that's apparently original. And that's original. Those are that's where they live. And then the steering wheel didn't come out far enough to us, so we were both reaching using you know ape arm style. With no uh, power steering. With no power steering. So it was just ergonomically very challenging yeah. to drive. And the the last car I drove of theirs, the rear engine, five hundred horsepower, six cylinder one, he had re engineered the ergonomics. Yes. So it, I was like, why is this one like not like the last one? He's like, well, because the last one was built for a guy who's six foot three and two hundred and fifty pounds, and this one was built for a little person. Yes. So the video is coming out. It's it's funny because I'm miserable, and videos where I'm miserable are funny, and it's a very nice build. I mean, it's got a glass panoramic roof. It's got a touchscreen, you know, interface. It's got all keyless start. It's got mm-hmm. a bunch of cool shit in it. Yeah. That I would like to see in a 
Mini that was a little more comfortable. Yeah, they, they do really high quality work. I mean, this is the third car now that I would say they're put together really well. And they integrate different generations of controls, I think, really neatly. Like, mm-hmm. their, their start buttons that they make themselves, I think, that are milled that look nice. But then the stuff from the, what, R52? R53. 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 Yeah, like, the 2003 It all works Mini. really, really well and aesthetically works. And, it, and the fit and finish is good. It's just like these two ergonomic things that didn't work for us. Yeah. But it's got a bunch of shit. Rips. I like that engine. That thing yeah, it's cool. felt way too fast. When it hit, when it went on cam, dude, the torque steer was legit during the <laughs> drive-bys. It was hairy. Yeah. Yeah. It was cool. It just, yeah. it didn't, it didn't work for me, but that video is coming out too. Yeah. All right. The Patreon is chock full of questions. Of course, if you want to take part, it's uh, patreon.com slash the smoking tire podcast. You can post questions for our crew shows and for our guests. You can get an ad free experience. You can get uh, uh, instant uploads once the live show ends. You don't have to wait till Tuesday, Thursday. All of those things are available. Patreon.com slash the smoking tire podcast. Um, we didn't get a chance to pre go through these questions because we just got back from a shoot. So we will. Um, uh, we will, uh, we may have some ums and uhs and we may have to skip a few questions. People haven't, have started writing really long questions again. They have. So it's true. Please, um, please patrons try to, uh, be as descriptive as you can. But, but if you write a whole entire paragraph, I don't think I can read it. Uh, Tim says, would you have a new S class or a lucid air dream? It depends on where I live. Do I have charging? Is there charging around me? Uh, I actually haven't driven a new S class either, so I don't. I know. haven't driven a new S class either. I want to drive the EQS. That's what I really want to drive. The Mercedes EV. I would definitely rather have a Lucid than the EQS, just because I can't stand how the EQS looks. It does look a little weird. Yeah. I saw my first uh, customer-owned Lucid at Cars and Coffee. It was owned by uh, this dude named Tony, who we who uh, who we call Tony from Sony because he's the president of Sony. And uh, he's a very nice guy, and he's very into cars. He's, a, he's cool as fuck. And he's really into his Lucid. Uh, and, and the trunk uh, panel gap looks better on his production car than on the pre-production wow. one we drove. Um, I mean, I don't know if I'd rather... I, the problem with, the, with that question is that the question can be boiled down to, would you rather have a gas car or an electric car? Mm-hmm. They're not the same. Right. It's, you can't compare them. If you want an electric car, you got to you, you got to decide you want an electric car and then shop from those. You, it's just not really a comparable experience, I don't think. In an ideal world, I'd rather have the Lucid because I really like the way electric cars feel for commuting and driving. It's just it's very calming and quiet, and being able to plug in is nice, and skipping gas stations is nice. But you know, it, it just really depends. Like if, if I'm on a road trip, the thing a lot. I want a gas car. Yeah. But I, the Lucid was really very nice. Yeah, it really was. It was. Uh, Israel Stern, what cars get you excited after being in the car game for so long? Uh, very engaging cars. I mean, really, like, I, I was excited about the 86. I thought that was great. This Blackwing we just did 25 minutes on, I was, I'm excited about that. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, the new... Um, a, a new Porsche sports car is always exciting because they know how to build a great a great driver's car. That's that's kind of what gets me excited. I agree with that. And, and I think some classic cars... stuff, too, that the audience doesn't give a shit about. I was so excited about driving Parnelli Jones's Mustang, and the audience didn't give a shit. Yeah. You know, that so, Alpha was cool. Yeah, I was uh, so excited yeah. about driving cool, cool vintage stuff that the audience doesn't care about. Yeah. Which I think speaks to the engagement. Like, we like driving old stuff because it has a story – and it's usually more engaging. So if a new car has at least one of those, then it's going to be uh, we're going to be excited about it. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, this is a I'm going to boil this down to questions to to the question port- portion of it. There's a lot of back information here. Nate Lincoln, should I buy an M240i manual with 61,000 miles? or a near-perfect, low-mileage M235i manual with tasteful mods for the same price? Um, (sighs) I have not driven an M240. I drove an M235, and it's like... The M235 is like, okay. Yeah, it's fine. It's pretty nice. It's not... um, 
I mean, did you enjoy? Do I recall enjoying one more than the other? No, not really. I don't recall enjoying one more than the other. Um, ma- for manual coops for twenty six to twenty nine thousand uh, dollars. I would I would personally have to look up what the changes were from two forty two thirty five to two forty because, for example, if they stiffen the bushings on the two forty because they want to make it more engaging and quicker, that might get you a lot of the performance that the the tasteful mods, depending on what those are, get you, and then you're getting a newer car. Yeah. which will have, you know, retain its value a little bit longer and possibly have a warranty a little bit longer. You know, if they made changes like that where the modded 235 is getting near the 240, then I get the newer one. I mean, with a BMW, I'd rather have a lower mile older one than a than a new a higher mile newer one. Hmm. I'd rather have in general, forget the mods. Near perfect low mileage M235 ver- versus fairly nice M240i with medium high mileage. I'd rather have the near perfect low mileage one in general. Okay. You don't, he doesn't get, there's no value in the mods. The mods are, you, you go for stock for stock. I agree. I just yeah. think it's like if he's drawn to the mods because they give him performance, that performance may have been added in the 240 generation, depending yeah. on what it is. I mean, twenty six to twenty nine thousand dollars is a, you can, that's a lot of money. You know, you can get pretty great little sports car for that. You're into Caymans, mm-hmm. you know. You're into S two thousands. You're into you're brand. In- you get a brand new BRZ, yeah. a brand new eighty six. Like I'd rather have a brand new eighty six than a, a used M two thirty five I. Hundred percent agree. Yeah. Yes. It's not as fast, but it's more fun. Yep. You get a warranty. Yep. Interior is about the same size. You're in a brand, you're in a brand new car. Yep, seats you know? fold down, all yeah. that shit. Yeah, I'd probably, I'd probably, maybe you could stretch it. Maybe you could stretch it to 31 or 32, and you get the BRZ if you care, you know, or you get the Sport Pack with the summer tires and all that kind of stuff. But for that kind of money, I would rather have the brand new 86. Jake Shores, fit wants to know about the fit and finish of interior and panel gaps on the Lucid versus Tesla. I haven't spent a lot of time in the newest plaid. I parked one. Customers got one. I parked mm-hmm. it here. That yoke was a fucking absurd. It was so awful to park that but I my, the other thing I noticed immediately was that my Mach E felt higher quality than the plaid on the inside and the Lucid is substantially nicer than the Mach E. The Lucid is only really behind the highest level Germans. Mm-hmm. I would put the Lucid at the same level as like... Neutron GT? Me- mid-level Audis. Yeah. Or, yeah. And really, I think the separator there is just the architecture in terms of the design style they go with. Like Lucid went with the the fabric and, and the brighter woods, almost like Volvo does, but without the kind of hard square shapes. Yeah. Whereas Audi's just like they're big on black stuff and, you know, more angles. But yeah. I think it's it's on it's up there with them. Yeah. I mean the the Teslas for the money, what you're paying for is not quality. You're paying for the you're paying for the charge network. You're paying for the 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 um, the screen software, you, the the experience of being EV. They look good. Mm-hmm. It's nice. They're nice looking, um, but the but the quality of them is not what you're paying for there. Um, Prashan, I really appreciate that you wrote out 300 words on how to describe EVs, but I am not reading your dissertation. I just, I'm looking at it and it's taking Zach three seconds to scroll through it. I, I'm sorry, bud. I appreciate what you did there, but I'm not reading that on air. Um, let's see. Sean Finney, how well does tuned, do, how does well tuned aftermarket suspension, i.e., Olin's, JRZ, et cetera, on sports cars compared to the best tuned stock suspensions, such as the new BRZ, Cayman, C8, et cetera? If a driver wants road feel, good turn-in, and compliance, is a well-tuned stock suspension with all the R&D that goes into it always a better option? Not always. Because, so the good things about a stock suspension are it was designed with many, many resources exactly for that car, right? It was designed to handle that exact weight distribution, that exact... Uh, level of NVH that exact, you know, but it's compromised because 
what one person wants to do with a car is not necessarily what the, another person wants to do with the car. And so changing a suspension is great if you want to either narrow the car's focus, like a Mustang GT is a great example. You know, that car's got to be everything to everybody, right? Cast the widest possible net. But if you want your Mustang GT to be optimized for the track, then you might not care if it's as quiet or as refined, but you want it to be stiffer. If, or maybe there, the compromise is that the is in the budget, right? Maybe the the budget of the car, like for instance, my Mach E, they wanted to build it to a certain price point, so they used whatever shock fit in that price point. They didn't use the nicest, most expensive shock available that would offer perhaps better body control. Right. I mean, so because shocks, he mentions the aftermarket solutions. You know, JRZ Very high and, end. and Olin's are the the most expensive suspension you can get basically mm -hmm. off the shelf. Ten to twenty thousand dollars. I mean, that's almost the price of the Miata that you referenced. So I I think that a shock at that high end was probably gonna always be nicer than the other one, but you're gonna have to have it tuned perfectly by someone who has the same knowledge and experience as the OEMs do. Because right. the engineers that set up the OEM cars are really good drivers and they're really good engineers. So that's why those cars can do a lot of things pretty well. You're gonna to have to have, if you just bolt the shit on, you know. It has to be fine say, tuned. If you can adjust it, you'll adjust it wrong. It has, right. it has to be fine tuned. So the, the, I think the better, the, the higher quality part, if they're both tuned with equal um, aptitude, is gonna be better. But and also, uh, in your examples, Cayman C, of the three examples, new BRZ, Cayman, and C8, two of the three have uh, have adjustable suspensions, meaning they have sport modes. Right. Magride. Magride, or if not magride, like the Cayman has a traditionally adjustable, it's not magnetic, but, but so that's how you get good feel turning in compliance most of the time, unless you're Lotus, and then they have magic. Um, if you want to use your car for a variety of things, well to, a well-tuned stock suspension is typically better. If you want to narrow the focus or spend money where the factory couldn't spend money, then you're better off going with a well-tuned aftermarket suspension. Um, but in a lot, of, if you're talking about JRZ and Olin's, you could spend 50% of the value of the car uh, on that kind of exactly. stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know the Focus RS when I when I wanted to that had an adaptive suspension that I took out and put in a KW dynamic adapt the retail value of that suspension was like eight thousand dollars on a car that was forty it's twenty percent of the whole car you know what I mean mm -hmm. it's it's diminishing returns at that point it made it better but how much better you know um, Dan B uh, why do watch guys seem to hate Tag presumably Dan means Tag Heuer, uh, and what are some brands in the mid or entry levels for automatic divers that you like? Uh, Dan, I think I first off I don't think that watch guys hate Tag Heuer. Uh, I think that there are some interesting and historically significant uh, Heuers and Tag Heuers. Uh, the Tag Carrera is an excellent watch. Um, there, there's there's. The, te the Hoyer Monaco, which is the square watch that Steve McQueen wore in Le Mans, is, um, is uh, legendary. I mean, you wear, you wear a Hoyer Monaco or tag Hoyer Monaco to any, any watch or car function, and you, you're getting respect. There's, no, um, uh, there's plenty of watches that tag Hoyer makes that are very, very cool and carry lots of watch and car guy cred. Having said that, I don't like all of Tag's designs. Some of their stuff is very busy. Some of their stuff is a little bro-y. Um, and not all of it's for me. But I think I do not think you're accurate in saying that why, why that watch guys hate Tag Heuer. They, they don't. Um, second part of the question, was that affordable automatic diver? Uh, Oris. We don't talk enough about Oris watches, but Oris makes a phenomenal... Uh, dive watch that Oris Divers 65 um, is I think under 2,000 bucks, 1,800 bucks. That one on the left, right there, uh, the Divers 65. I think this one is a limited edition that Zach has just pulled up. Uh, yeah, that one is 2,100. Um, I don't know exactly what he means by by uh, by 
in terms of pricing, but these things range from like a thousand to twenty two hundred uh, on the used market, and plenty of watch guy cred, plenty of functionality. Oris makes a really great piece. Um, Seiko divers are great. I talk about them a lot. What else uh, do we like? Oh, Zodiac. Um, uh, Zodiac makes a makes a cool dive watch. Uh, the Mido Ocean Star. Yeah, the Zodiac dive watch. They have some really cool colors. Um, if you go to go to the image. Oh, you spelled it wrong. That's why you spelled it with a K. If you spell with a K, man. You spell it with a C, you get the better results. You know. Zodiac dive watch. Yeah, so they got some. They got that one on the right. The men's the Zodiac Super Sea Wolf. That's like a thousand bucks. Pretty cool piece. Comes in a uh, a variety of colors. I really like that white one. Actually, I think the white one's pretty fun. That's a nice one. All right, that's around a thousand. Baltic makes a decent watch. Around a thousand bucks. Um, Kevin McCann uh, says since Rolex seems impossible to get. I am looking at Breitling and Chopard watches. I'm not that into Chopard. I know they sponsor the Milli Millia. They sponsor some other stuff that's pretty cool, and I'm glad they, they do that. I'm not that into Chopard. Breitling's more simple designs, I really like. The uh, Super Ocean 42, I'm a huge fan of. I just advised my friend Larry Casilla to buy himself a Super Ocean 42, which I thought was really nice. I also like the really the Breitling Trans Ocean. Yeah, the, the one with the, where you can see the numbers. That one right there. Super Ocean Automatic 42, love it. Works with a bunch of different straps. Great, great watch. Fucking tank of a watch. It's not too thick. Not too chunky, fits under some under your, your shirt sleeves with a long sleeve shirt, especially the 42, because they also make it into 44. Uh, but really, really tough, great for water stuff, great for every day. And you can switch out the straps, totally change the look. You go with a, a leather strap, you go with a rubber strap. I like the Pro Diver rubber strap there with the cloud. Oh, go down. Look at those, I like the orange dials. You got some different colored That's dials. Nice orange. They also have a black dial that has a yellow ring inside the dial that I really am into. Um, they're lovely. So I'm a, I'm a fan of Breitling. The Navitimer range is very cool as well. If you wanted something a little more history. Uh, David Cargo says, I'm res uh, I am replacing old suspension and brake parts in a VW Golf. Should I go with used GTI parts or new OEM golf parts? Uh, I don't, I mean. Depends on the parts. And, and how I mean, used they are. I mean. Right. And like, like I know that you can take M3 control arms off of some generations of M3s and put them on like the M240 <clears throat> or the M135. Like, and okay, well now you have a wider track and you're going to have, and there might be aluminum instead of cast or it might be forged. Like the parts could be higher quality, but I don't know enough about golfs and GTIs to tell you yes or no for that. Well, know? and the, the word parts is doing a lot of heavy lifting. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, right. are we, can we upgrade, are we talking about GTI uh, calipers and rotors, like a whole brake assembly? Or are we talking about used bushings or something? You know, what are we talking about? Right. Um, it, I would not, I would, I would consult with a specialist with the individual parts we're talking about. Um, we're, I think replacing your old suspension and brake parts with brand new OEM stuff will drastically improve your car's performance. Yeah, you probably. won't realize how tired that shit is until you put brand new stuff on. You go, oh, this is what it's supposed to be like. Um, but I wouldn't just haphazardly put some stuff off a GTI on ex expecting it to make your car more like a GTI. It may, it may not. And if the stuff is super used and tired... You may, you know what I mean, right? Then you're in the same situation you were you begin with. Yeah, uh, my garage bay. Do you think a Dodge Magnum SRT8 is a thirty thousand dollar driving experience? No. It may be something that it may not. I don't because it's just an old SRT car with an automatic, right? It's 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 a six one. It's not a six four. It's a four hundred twenty horsepower. You know. Uh, charger that happens to be a wagon, basically, and to me that's not a very premium experience. If they're talking, if this person's talking about a collector grade, low mile mint 
it may be it may have thirty thousand dollars of presence at a car show because mm-hmm. you don't see it a lot. But if we're talking about turning the wheel, pressing the pedals, and driving it down the road, I don't really see that as being a thirty thousand dollars experience. They are cool. They're and very if I cool. see a really nice Magnum on the street, I'm stoked. Yeah. There's a girl in my Pilates class who is a smoke show, who is an artist and drives a fucking Magnum. Wow. She lives up the street from me, and she is, she rules. I just, I'm like, you're into cars? What the fuck? She's an El Camino and a Magnum. She's like the most Venice chick ever. Wow. She's great. But, and I'm like, respect, mad respect. And if one has like a manual swap and a Hellcat engine or something, like fucking cool. But like, you know, it's just an old V8 sedan, really. There's not, it's not, it's not a, it's not a, Super premium. It's a 15 year old Chrysler. It's not a CTSV wagon, right? Because it doesn't have the performance chops underneath the suspension to make it that thing. But it, yeah. it's a wagon muscle car. Yeah, which are fun. Yeah, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't pay up for one of those. Uh, okay, Jake Chernicki. Is there a point in ownership where starting to modify your car isn't worth it? Uh, I've had my stock Mark 7 GTI for 90,000 miles, and putting a tune on it seems like kind of a waste, given the car is probably halfway through its lifespan. I'm thinking a stage one, two intake and wheels. The car is well maintained and free of mechanical problems. The best time to tune your car is right when you buy it, because you're getting the maximum amount of value for that for that those aftermarket parts. Well, maybe keeping the the, the warranty. Maybe. Maybe. But like Jack Baruth wrote a great piece on when is the right time to modify your car. I think if it was for Haggerty and his argument, and which I actually agree with, is that it's right. In, it's as soon as you get the car. Why? Because you get the most value of, at, like he's saying, the car is halfway through his lifespan. If he got those parts the very first day he got the car, he would get twice as much enjoyment out of those parts. But don't you think there's some value to driving the car in its stock form so you get to know it like that, Maybe. and then you find what do you want to change? Could be. Sure. Sure. Uh, but a stage one tune and an intake. The, the intake is not going to do anything. It might make it sound Whoa, a little bit more, but it's not really going to do anything. A stage one tune is fine because it's relatively affordable. Mm-hmm. It's you just you get relatively the, safe. Relatively safe. You plug in the fuck. You plug it in, and if you got another one, you might be able to take the tune with you. Might, right? But it's not. It's not like it's a mechanical thing and wheels you know sure if you if you're going to keep the car if you know you're going to keep the car for a long time and changing up the look is going to help keep you interested in that car i mean what's the what's the alternative is the alternative just keeping it like it is or is the alternative selling it and getting a different car that's a different question Mm -hmm. so if spending two grand now on new wheels and tires maybe it's more than two grand three grand New wheels and tires, intake, and a tune. And that gives you a year and a half worth of extra happiness with your car versus selling the car and, you know, having to spend a whole lot more money on another one to be excited about it. That's yeah. okay. Yeah. I mean, but in general, general advice, you shouldn't modify the car if you've already got plans to sell it. That's that's for sure. Because the question was, is there a point, is there a point at which it's not worth it? If you've already started to get tired of this car and you don't think these mods will make you sufficiently interested in the car again, just get rid of it. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's good advice. Um, or like if you've already ordered a new car. Well, yeah, obviously. <laughs> you know, that would be stupid. Yeah, don't – yeah. I wouldn't or, – or if you think that like, you know, if it comes down to modding it or doing key maintenance, that's where it's not worth it. Just do yes. the maintenance. Yeah, um, Crandy says, what do you think have been the most impactful car ownership experiences, positive and negative, that have mm. shaped your current perspective on ownership? I mean, that's a great question. For me, every car I've owned, bought and sold, I've learned something from. And I've taken that knowledge with me to the next car I bought. I mean, I... I... I bought a Hummer because I thought I would wanted to be some somebody that I wasn't, you know what I mean? And 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 I learned I didn't want a car that big. I didn't want a car that slow. I didn't want a car that stupid. I didn't want to be that guy, you know. And I I I I bought a Mini, and I learned that I really like small cars that have a lot of room inside, 
and I learned that I really like drive like an asshole in small cars like that. But I learned that you shouldn't get wheels that are too big because you can bend them. Mm-hmm. You know. Then I bought a, a a Corvette, and I learned about the uh, the durability of a of an American V8 powertrain, but that. Not everything about a Corvette was just a Chevy because there's some very, very expensive, unique to Corvette parts. You know, there's all kinds of different stuff that I've picked up from every car I've owned um, that I've brought to the next car. I learned to not fucking order anything that I haven't s- driven before. My or- I ordered a Focus RS and, right. and put a deposit yeah. on it before I ever drove one. And then when it showed up, it fucking hurt my back, like starting on day one. But I'd signed a lease. Yeah, you're stuck. I was stuck with yeah. the fucking thing. You know that was that was a that was a horrible idea. Um, I think like so I'm realizing so many of my cars, half my cars have been like slightly unreliable, like the muscle car, or the Jetta that I beat the shit out of, or the Miata, which actually kept working, which is very strange. Um, but like the muscle car, I learned to work on cars and that they are just like machines and that's very gratifying. But when I got the Crown Vic or the Civic I had, or anytime I've owned something newish or like, there is a great luxury in knowing that this car will turn on all the time and just work and it's very simple. Yeah. Like that's the positive experience of the cars I own that are, might seem boring is that boring, if it's gonna be boring, it should be durable as fuck, you yeah. know, like a block of wood. And so when people go, oh, they, their daily is a Camry or something. Like when I first got my M3, people say like, well, what's your daily? And I was like, what? Why would you do that? And now I completely realize why you do that. Like mm-hmm. having a fun car, which is a luxury, being able to have two cars is a luxury. But the positive experiences of the boring cars are that you learn the value in that. Yeah, I mean, there's, I, I also I've learned the value in, I've learned that like. Take, I've learned from two different cars that taking out your interior has d- enormously diminishing returns. I bet. Yeah. There's no reason yeah. to take your interior out or add a, a roll cage or harnesses to something that doesn't live at the track. Yeah, every now and then I think of taking my back seat out to Don't. save weight. And no. every time I put the seat on, I go, it's so much louder in here. So like, loud. I, I really like my, when my car is quiet yeah. and when, when the road's smooth. Like, yeah. That's a good thing. Yeah. yeah. It's it, It's... And I've had I've got a story like that from from every car I've owned, where oh okay I'll never I'll I I learned that I want this going forward and that I'll never do this part of it again from every single car yeah yeah uh, good question though uh, can you look up this Zach Chappie says thoughts on Porsche now assembling Singer engines I I can't possibly imagine this is true. But maybe we missed the news. Porsche agrees wow. to Porsche agrees to build engines for Singer. Oh, this is from yesterday. Okay, let's see. Uh, let's see what's going on here. Um, okay, Porsche Motorsport North America will assemble engines from Singer. Uh, accord will build engines according to Singer's exact specifications. You think if this is a you can't beat them, join them? Wow. I mean. Uh, this Maybe. is, uh, let's see, Let me, so are we just, are we learn this right now. Uh, the new collaboration focuses exclusively on the assembly of remanufactured engines. Okay. Uh, we'll continue to, maybe, the, I mean, maybe they got to, cause, cause I believe Rothsport was doing it before. They were they were building the DLS engines for sure. Were they building the other ones as well? The the regular singers. They were building the regular ones okay. too. Uh, wow. Singer is uh, only manufactured. Duh, duh, duh. Engines will be assembled. Oh, they'll be assembled at the Porsche Experience Center. Wow. Now that's interesting. I mean, this is very surprising considering how aggressively Porsche pursued. You know, uh, how, they were very. Critical of how Singer named their cars, and that's why all the cars had to change to like yeah. the Singer California or the Singer Mountain by... or whatever. You know, they they were named kind of after the client, but that's because they couldn't call them Porsche 911 anymore. I mean, there's plenty of documentation about that. So yeah, maybe it, they can't beat them, join them. They finally came around on going. Well, if these are doing because these cars have done great fucking things for the Porsche brand, and yeah. it was kind of annoying for a while that Porsche was so anti Singer. So maybe they're like, well, if they're gonna 
be known as a Porsche, then why don't maybe you just can be involved somehow and build the engines. And, and I mean, then there the could also be good, an enormous amount of profit in this too. Oh, of course. I mean, they could charge a lot of money for these engines, m far more than if they were just selling engines to existing Porsche clients. Um, well, because now it has Porsche's badge of approval on it. Yeah. And, and that probably helps the value of the cars. And um, maybe the reliability. Well, not that Rossport was unreliable. Well, I mean, we just learned that right now. But wow. thanks for uh, thanks for letting us know, uh, Chappie. Yeah. Um, surely they could do a, a factory singer type car and charge two million dollars and sell sell as many as they could build. I mean, yes, they could, and they might. I mean, there's there's, uh, but the I think the reason they don't, it, it's not. Porsche is always trying to look forward. You know, they're they're not when you're the factory. Um, they're always looking forward to the new technology, the new efficient. They 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 probably need a singer. I mean, there there's there. I, what I could see would be more likely is if they take an ownership stake in Singer at some point, or if Singer you know maybe Singer sells out to them entirely and they use that as a way to. Um, to sell those cars outside of the manufacturer, you know, uh, thing. But because Porsche Motorsport doesn't have to meet EPA regulations, you know, they could. Oh, we're just selling engines. Mm -hmm. There, we don't know what's happening to them, you know. So, so they could. They there could be some kind of asterisk on there. Interesting. Uh, Edgar's has a. Watch question. I have a Seiko SKX 009. It's a nice watch. Do you foresee it shooting? I think that should say up yeah. in price demand. No, it's, these watches don't. They don't go up in uh, price or demand. Um, they, they're, they're. I mean, and if, even if they did, th that watch is like a. It's like a two hundred dollar watch. So if it goes up, what's it going to go up to two hundred and forty dollars? It's not like it's going to go from two hundred to two thousand or to twenty thousand. So, so he has some mods he would, has not installed. I have mods I haven't installed yet. A ceramic bezel, double domed crystal, but I'm hesitant to install. Would these mods help or hurt the longevity of the watch? They won't affect the longevity of the watch at all, as long as they are installed by someone who make sure to test the water resistance of the watch. If you change the crystal yourself at home and you fuck up, that watch might not be waterproof anymore. Um, so, you know, that's on you. But just the presence of an, a, a different crystal or a different bezel will not affect the longevity of the watch at all. Uh... Atticus Solieri, yes, I did see the aftermarket Tesla uh, yoke conversion that makes turns it back into a wheel. It's very funny. I mean, it it just turns it into an ugly flat bottom steering yeah, wheel. Like a really but at least one. it, but it would it would actually improve the functionality of that. Um, Mike V11, two car solution wants a daily for forty five to fifty. Five thousand dollars, thirty-five mile commute. Live in Westchester, New York, and commute to Bear Mountain. That's a nice commute. Nice road, right? Nice roads. Uh, there's a there's an open highway, and that that would then then goes to some windy back roads. Um, but the second fun car is a a, a seven one eight GTS Porsche. So, um, man, forty five to fifty five k. You you want a year round sports sedan? S three, S three would be great. I mean that would be a really nice daily, a hundred percent. Or um, let's see, forty five to fifty five. Does that get you? I mean, well, depending on how old you wanted to go. If you wanted to go old, a really nice RS four B seven RS four. Uh, True. Uh, it would get you in a. Oh man, forty five. Will that get you in a decent Grand Cherokee? Because if it's year round, it does snow, it'll get you an right? entry level brand new Grand Cherokee? How often does it snow in like Westchester and Bear Mountain? Yeah, it Only snows. A bit. You got you you got to be able to drive in the snow. All right, but you can do. You'll find you're fine with a car. You don't necessarily need. You don't need things. an SUV, but you but. All right, I would go. Uh, S three or IS five hundred. No, that's like you get into. Grand. I mean, you could probably get into a Q five. 
Audi Q5 would be pretty nice. Yep. My mom's got a Q5, a, a two liter. It's lovely. Yeah. I mean, it's comfortable. It's reasonably sporty. Um, it gets good fuel economy. You know, I mean, if you've already got a Porsche, you don't need another Porsche, right? I mean, you could, you could, I mean, Outback, 40 grand Outback Wilderness. Yeah. Pretty nice. Good car. It doesn't need to be manual. Rides was, quiet. It was comfy, spacious, great in, great in all weather. Outback Wilderness was a nice thing. I really enjoyed that car. We've got the new WRX coming next week. Uh, Golf R, budget for snow tires, brand new Golf R and budget for some snow tires, mm -hmm. or or you're right on the Audi. That Audi S3 would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jim Eldridge, I think this question has been said a million times. The, basically, the question is, noticing the declining number of wagons being offered in the U.S., do you think Americans hate wagons, or are they becoming increasingly niche and enthusiast? Uh, Americans, it's not that Americans hate wagons. It's that the average American will find a crossover to be more useful than a wagon. Mm -hmm. It'll have a taller ride height, which a lot of people like. It'll have a bigger greenhouse, which a lot of people like. It'll have bigger wheels and tires, which a lot of people like because our infrastructure is declining. <laughs> um, and and you can get you get that hip height entry level, which mm -hmm. I can I can understand. So uh, in, in Europe, where the roads are twistier and the lower center of gravity matters and, and uh, it, there's more cultural reasons to stick with wagons, they're, they're more popular and they're more fuel efficient than the crossover, uh, 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 crossover counterparts. And the nerdy enthusiasts like us, we like wagons. But the average American would doesn't do, cannot tell a dynamic difference right. between a crossover and a wagon. They don't give a, a shit about lower center of gravity. Yeah. They just don't. And they didn't. They didn't give a shit about it when they bought wagons in the '80s or '70s. It was just like this does with the things I need it to do. Uh, Martin Bueno, uh, what is the dream build for you guys? Unlimited money doesn't matter. The layout of the engine, a McLaren F1. It's not. Doesn't have to. You don't have to build it. Yeah. Uh, his example is a T50. Also a great option. I think the McLaren F1 is a little better looking than the T50. Um, yeah, those are good. You don't need to build it. I mean, all, companies already. The, the my dream cars are not builds; they're factory cars. Ferrari F40. You know, that's a, that's a dream. Ferrari F40, F50, McLaren F1. You know, the analog supercars of that period. Mm -hmm. That give me a whole garage full of them. I don't need yeah. to go build anything. Else. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Someone's done the R and D. Yeah. Um, Daniel Berman. Uh, what about a custom alignment transforms a car's handling characteristics? So much. A lot. So much. Yeah. I mean, it can change. It can change. It, a car can feel eager to turn into a corner or it can feel like it doesn't want to, you know, based on camber and toe. Um, if the alignment's set up really badly, you know, or if the alignment changes under compression, like that's what the... S2000 AP1, I think, was known for, like hard compression and cornering the uh, the wheel toes out. My car, too. My car now has like a control arms that keep the rear toe fixed. So that way you know what the back wheels are going to do. Because when they toe out, they want to, the back end wants to steer mm -hmm. out and kind of go into a drift. Like it can completely change the character of the car. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, it can make your steering lazy or it can make it extra sharp. It can make the rear end drifty or it can make the car understeer. I mean, mm -hmm. you can, you can dial that kind of stuff in. So like a car can track straight down the highway with yeah. your hands off or it can be all over the place. Yeah. Just simple stuff. Um, do we have how many, how much we got left? Just this? Just okay, this. great. Good. Uh, Richard H. Would you rather daily drive a Macan GTS or a Taycan Cross Turismo 4? I mean, I'd rather drive a Taycan. Yeah, but I think this I is like the S-Class Lucid uh, question. It's the same thing. Yeah. You want a gas car, you want an electric car. If an electric car will fit your lifestyle, it'll be great. Yep. If it won't, then a Macan is a lovely thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Vlad Tataranu, how do you break in a new engine? I break in here. a new engine by not beating the shit out of it and by not holding it at one RP. Like, I wouldn't get on the highway, set the cruise at 70, and then not touch the pedal for, for a, thousand miles. a thousand miles. And I wouldn't 
bang it off the rev limiter a bunch of times either and beat the shit out of it. I would just drive it normally without being abusive for a couple thousand miles. Yeah. That's pretty much it. Well, I've only broken in the STI and that's what I did. Just kept it under 2K under red line for a thousand yeah. miles. Yeah. Keep it off the red line, keep your foot off the floorboard and don't sit at the same RPM forever. That's pretty much it. Um, okay, wait. Ryan Bark, last question. Best fifty to sixty thousand dollar tall wagon or medium SUV to replace a Tiguan as a daily driver family car in Denver. Second car is a Cayman GT4. Uh, considerations are Volvo XC60, low spec Dis Defender 110, or other. I mean, uh, XC60 haven't driven yet. The last one I drove was all right. Defenders are great. You want to be able to get some options, though. It'll feel pretty stripped out if you get if you get a super low spec one. And I wouldn't want a four cylinder in the one ten, especially mm. in, if you're going over mountains. Uh, I mean, fifty to sixty is a tough. Uh, again, the, I mean, this is recency bias, but um, Camisa was put a thing on Instagram about the Venza that he liked a lot. Oh, that's yeah. a hybrid, which I think is a good looking. Like if you had an F type badge on that, like the back end of it looks very similar to the um, the Jaguar SUVs. Like it's a good looking car, and it's just gonna drive, and it's gonna do that forever. Yeah, you know, it's a Toyota product. I mean, Q5 is again nice. F Pace, Jag F Pace, F Pace is pretty nice product. I liked that. Um, Lexus uh, Lexus RX. You may not like the styling, but it is a high quality product. True. Um, the uh, what's the 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 uh, well the, I'm the just, Hyundai I'm, I'm the still Hyundai a huge Kia. fan of the Grand Cherokee. I think it's just one of the best looking trucks, and has been for like eight years. The I, brand like, new one, you like yeah, the, it's like the way the designs look. Not not the big, not the Wagoneer, just regular Grand Cherokee. Yeah, big fan. I haven't I haven't really messed with it yet, so I don't really know. Um, what's like? It's just not, I, I hate to say, I, I, I want to be helpful, but it's just really not my area of it. I haven't driven any of those products. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have a mid-range crossover reference. Like, I've got, like, Outback Wilderness is, like, 40. I, don't, I know we just said it, but, like, there's kind of a gap there. Like, you know, there's kind of a gap in, in like, the, the watch world, too. Where like there's almost no difference in quality from a five hundred dollar to a two thousand dollar watch, all that is branding. And then when you get over two grand, it's like the same thing from like forty four to sixty grand. Like there's not a lot of difference. It's like branding. Mm -hmm. Like I, True. I would like, what is like I I don't even know. Like I well, there's like there's like X3 is in there or GLA yeah, or I you know those kinds of things. The GLA, but those are small. I mean, the X3 is not that small. The X3 and the Q5 are basically the same. But like, I don't know. I'm not. I wouldn't say those are best. You know, tw if you want to if you want to replace the Tiguan and you like the Tiguan, get a Q5. Like that's a nice product mm -hmm. and it'll feel familiar and, and you're gonna like it. It'll yeah. be you that size works. If you want something a little more spacious, for a little less money. Outback Wilderness. If you wanted something a little bigger for the same money, like the Hyundai, like uh, what's the, oh, Palisade? the Palisade? Yeah, Palisade is like a really nice product. Or, or the, the Telluride. Telluride. It's a really nice yeah, product. You get so much value for your money. Oh, what's yeah. the Genesis um, oh, GV70? GV mm -hmm. That's a very nice product True. as well. That look. That's yeah. a great looking product. So I, I would look at those. Um, I don't know about the Polestar Four. That's what they just, he said, the Polestar 2 is great, but a little too small. Wait, wait a year, no I idea. wait a year. I mean, if you want, but but again, we're talking, that's EVs. Like, an EV works for you? Like, get a Mach-E. Um, 55 to 60K? Mach-E. All-wheel drive. drive. Done. Yep. I mean, if the, I didn't even realize, read the last sentence, but, you know, if you're comparing gas, we, this is the theme of this show. Don't compare yeah. gas cars to electric cars. If an electric car works for your family, just fucking get one, because they're great. Yeah. But they got. But if they. But but it's hard. Like, I can't advise you to get an electric car or to get a gas car. You got to know if that's going to work for you. If you got fifty five to sixty k to spend, get a Mach E, all wheel drive. They rule. That's our show. I'm not. I just. I realize. I'm like. I've gotten a little frustrated with that because I just don't have the product. I want to answer people's questions, but I don't have that like mid range fifty thousand dollar crossover right. is not in the data bank. 
Yeah, I mean, as we've said, like our audience likes to watch the fast stuff or the cheap, st- cheap sporty stuff or like the really crazy stuff, and then but ask the, us about the crossovers, right? But, well, <laughs> I understand why they're asking, but like if we tested the mid-level SUVs, they don't do that well. Like yeah. I tested the Telluride, and I was very impressed by it. But I mean, I don't know if we'll drive all the competition because the videos won't just won't get a lot of views. They don't. So we yeah. so that. But yeah, it's a good point. We don't drive them, so we don't have the that Rolodex. Yeah, that reference. I'm, I'm literally like, oh yeah, my mom has one and likes it. That's my reference. Yeah, yeah. It's like a Q5. Like I drove it twice when my mom bought it. Like and I and it was nice. Like that's all I got. Yeah. Um, but the Mach E, we have driven two models of Mach E, and they're great. So if you can get electric car, three, I I really, the press car was the premium X uh, all oh. wheel drive. The one I own is a premium X, uh, premium rear wheel drive. And then we drove the GT. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I've, I've got a lot of Mach-E experience, probably more than any other automotive journalist probably. because I don't know anyone else who bought one. Um, well, that's our show. Uh, Friday. We don't have another show between now and Friday, right? No. Friday, Reggie Watts is coming in. So we got Reggie Watts in the studio on Friday. That'll be really fun. And uh, and then we've got some more things after that. I don't remember what's next week because my brain is now turned to mush after this day. But that's okay. That's our show. And have a great rest of your day, everybody. We'll see you soon. <laughs>